Games and Old. So this session, which is sponsored by WWF Scotland, for which many thanks, is on building a zero carbon economy, um, a matter very close to our green hearts. Um, we are going to speak about the fact that the world urgently needs to shift to a climate resilient, low carbon development. Um, but the fact that we need to see decisive action at both local and national level. And also uh, the fact that there are opportunities within that change. So many opportunities. This isn't about sacrifice. This is about moving from crisis to opportunities and, we believe, to a better future. So we have um, fabulous panellists with us today. We have Robin Parker, who is the Public Affairs Manager for WWF Scotland. We have Councillor Claire Miller, who speaks on the economy for the Greens in the City of Edinburgh Council and sits on the Economy Committee and the Housing Committee. Um, Claire is also very active in the move to divest the Council's pension investments from, from fossil fuels and to make sure that they're heading in the right direction and also my parliamentary colleague, Ross Greer, who is our spokesperson on education and on Europe and external affairs. We're, going to hear, we're, we're also going to hear from, from Grace when she, has, <laughs> when she joins us, um, but we're going to hear from each of our panellists, um, and then we'll have a, a, you know, a good chance for discussion and questions. So without further ado, pass over to Robin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alison, and uh, thanks for uh, having WWF here at your conference. Um, I should probably start out by saying, of course, WWF is a charity. We work with um, all the political parties in the Scottish Parliament, but uh, we're always incredibly grateful, and we know that we can rely on uh, the Scottish Green MSPs to support our work in the Scottish Parliament, and that's really important and really appreciated by ourselves. I think perhaps the first thing to say is that climate change is already here. It's already amongst us. I think over the year gone by, it's been, we've not only seen it on our TV screens as we've seen the impact of climate change around the world, but we've also seen it and felt it very much here in Scotland. If you look back to the storms we had last winter, you look at the beast from, east, from the east, which brought so much snow to Scotland, but at the same time left the Arctic feeling incredibly, unseasonably, ridiculously warm, in, in fact. Um, we then had a wet spring. And then over the summer, we've had an incredibly hot period and the drought that that has brought to these islands and the impacts that has had for both wildlife and farmers around the country. So we've, we've really felt climate change this year. And I think what, something that was very particular about this summer is it wasn't just we were feeling that increased heat in one place. Uh, I remember speaking to relatives in America, they were feeling uh, unseasonable particular heat as well. There was a heat wave across the whole of Europe and health impacts and deaths that that caused across Europe. Uh, even up in the Scandinavian Arctic, we saw wildfires. And that's two words that you should never really hear in the same sentence, wildfires in the Arctic. And, and that's all with just the one degree of climate change that we as humans have already caused to our planet. And I think many of you will have noticed the, um, the really important IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which has already been mentioned at this conference. Uh, just at the beginning of last week. Uh, and what that report focused on was uh, the importance of keeping climate change to just one and a half degrees. Um, and I think this kind of focus on temperatures can seem very abstract, but uh, an analogy that really worked for me uh, on this was if you think about human body temperature, and we know that just half a degree in terms of body temperature, that can mean the difference between you being healthy, you being sick, or you being in a, you know, a really serious situation where we need to be calling an ambulance. Um, so these half degrees really do matter. And to bring it back to climate change and to our planet, um, that half a degree uh, that that report talked about, that's the difference between saving 30% of the world's corals versus if we allow climate change to hit two degrees of temperature change, we lose all the world's corals. And that's a really important, it's not just a, a beautiful habitat to look at, it's a, it's a habitat that uh, something in the region of uh, a billion people worldwide rely on. They're home to a quarter of marine species globally. Um, but also the difference between one and a half and two degrees has a really human impact. Um, one and a half degrees means 1.3 billion fewer people exposed to extreme heat waves. And it's the difference in the Arctic between a ice-free Arctic every 100 years and every 10 years. So every half a degree really matters on this when it comes to climate change. Um, and I think that 
report has to act as a, as a wake-up call, as a reminder. Uh, the planet is currently on track for three to four degrees of climate change. So we really have our work cut out. Uh, it has to be a wake-up call. It's, it's very pressing and urgent. Um, and I want to quote uh, one of the uh, academics who led that report, Professor Jim Ski. Um, and something he said about the report is that report showed that we can, we can do it. We can keep global temperature change to one and a half degrees within the laws of physics and chemistry. The final tick box is political will. So within that, we have the economic, social, the technological tools at our disposal to really step up the fight against climate change as we have to do very urgently, very pressingly uh, over the coming years. Um, and as kind of Alison hinted as, uh, in her introductory remarks, um, this can be something which doesn't just uh, save our planet and save the people of nature that rely on it, but also we can build a better society in the process. Um, there are very clear things that we need to be doing here in Scotland. We need to be building uh, more energy efficient homes. We need to be uh, restoring the energy efficiency of existing homes, something that will also tackle fuel poverty, improve health uh, and create jobs. Uh, we need to create cleaner uh, transport systems, so that means more cycling and walking, more public transport and electric vehicles. And again, that's something that's going to improve health, it's going to uh, give us cleaner, cleaner air, but it's also going to make our cities more livable and a, a better place to live. Um, we need to look at things like new ways of heating homes, and that can create new manufacturing opportunities here in Scotland. Um, and then something else that's already come up at conference, uh, restoring nature is really important to tackling climate change. If we can plant more trees, uh, if we can restore peatlands and then those kelp forests that John Fiddy was talking about earlier. All of those things have a role to play in taking carbon naturally out of the atmosphere and that helps tackle climate change as well. So uh, hopefully something we can get out of our discussion today is there are lots of reasons to be help hopeful and we can, we can turn this around um, and we all have a role to play in that. Uh, something I also will come back to perhaps later on and mention is um, there is currently a climate change bill in front of the Scottish Parliament. And, you know, climate change is, is a global thing and something that we as individuals, it can feel very difficult for us to have an impact on and, and to change. But um, that piece of legislation, that's something that can really change and shape the way that Scotland tackles climate change. We can step up our action uh, in the short term and also send a sort of a global message about the leadership role that we want to continue to play as Scotland in fighting climate change. Um, so that's something we should definitely come back to. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Robin. And I didn't even have to indicate that time was running out. That was, that was just perfect. Um, <laughs> and I look forward to hearing from Councillor Miller. Thanks, Alison. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of bring a bit of positivity to this. I, I was talking to my husband before coming this morning and saying, how do I bring positivity to a session on climate change when we've just had the IPCC report telling us about doom and gloom? And I thought, you know, actually, it just, it's a story about getting more Greens elected. Um, I think what we need to do is see that we actually have quite a lot of power to change these things. Um, and I was making a lot of notes about the sorts of things that we're working on in Edinburgh Council that are actually affecting change, but how much more we would need to do to be able to affect the change that the IPC has indicated that we need. Um, so what I'm going to do is just very briefly talk about some of the kind of strategic level things and then some of the examples of the stuff that's going on in Edinburgh. Um, and in preface to that, I, I sort of an apology that this is very urban centric because that's what I know. I'm the city centre councillor in the capital city. Um, so although I grew up rurally, I know that there are issues that are really, really different. This is gonna be a bit of an urban focused um, five minutes, I'm afraid, sorry. But um, just starting with that one, at an urban level, we need to recognise that we're consumers um, of things that are produced rurally and that there needs to be a, a recognition of the fact that, that the urban centres that are growing, you know, the forecast population growth in Edinburgh is massive and we need to be thinking how do we um, ensure that we have food security and energy security and things that we are not in control of that we rely on the rest of the country for. Um, I've also been working on the economy strategy in the council, and this is another area where if we had more green councillors elected, we would have much more control over it. I was fortunate enough to have um, a good negotiation with the convener of the committee and managed to get some sustainability issues included in the economy strategy, and I counted that as a win. But what we um, weren't able to get through and I desperately wanted was an acknowledgement that we need an economy strategy that recognises that we're basing our economy on um, finite resources um, and actually it's all built around growth. 
So the phrase that's throughout the report is good growth, and that's fantastic. It's good that they're recognising that we need to change our growth strategies um, and not just focus on pure growth at all costs. But actually, it's not a green economic strategy. And if we were in control in the council, it would be a much, much different strategy. So, you know, that's part of the, the, the frustration that I'm having just now, but the positives that I see for the future. Um, we also need carbon budgeting desperately in the council. Everything is, is budgeted in terms of financial budgets. And, you know, we all know here that that's not the way that we should be budgeting for the future. We need to obviously budget financially, but we need to understand what are things costing us in terms of the carbon. And we're not doing that yet in Edinburgh. And, it, it, you know, it just it blows my mind that we've got a capital city local authority running its um, council that way and not focusing on that at all. And when I look at the, um, the goals that the administration and the council have set out, they've got, you know, uh, pages long of what their strategic goals are for the five-year term. Um, they do have a goal that um, talks about, it says, it, it's number 18, it's buried. It says, improve Edinburgh's air quality and reduce carbon emissions and explore the implementation of low emission zones. And it's got a target around reducing the city council's carbon emissions, but it's not about the city's carbon emissions. And it's buried in and amongst the detail. Whereas I would much prefer that we would reverse that and say, you know, we're first and foremost, this is the biggest challenge we're facing. We have to be thinking about those things first and then drilling down into the other um, projects and initiatives that would come out of that. So these are some of the challenges that we're facing in the council where um, you know, local services are the area where we can actually make some of the differences that we need to make. And so at that level, some of the projects that are going on which will actually make a difference in terms of carbon emissions, um, we're looking at LEZs, we're looking at um, modal shift of how to, how to really change our transport in the city. Um, we've got a transformation programme going on just now which is looking at how to genuinely radically change the way that the city centre works and um, look at how people get about and it's got an equalities impact as well as a carbon reduction impact and a health impact. So it does, you know, it ties in with what Robin's saying about, you know, the wider benefits to society. Um, but, you know, there's, on, the, on the other side of it, we're still seeing things like tree reduction. So this week in Twitter, I found out through a phone call from my constituent and on Twitter that trees were being taken down in Princess Street Gardens. And we're seeing a net reduction in the city centre tree population. You know, so some of the natural sort of decarbonisation things that we should be focusing on are actually going the opposite direction and we're really struggling. Um, in terms of one of the big areas that I think the council has got a lot of power is in planning. Um, and at the minute, we're just in the, in the run-up to the new local development plan. And, you know, by actually bringing into the planning process um, much more um, economic, uh, environmental sustainability um, principles, we'd be able to designate land uses, we'd be able to, you know, have a lot more control over what type of um, land use we want. And we would also be able to um, enforce principles that would actually help us. We've got new developments coming on um, in Edinburgh which are starting to, to look at these better ways of building um, homes and commercial spaces. There's um, a good example in Fountain Bridge just now which is um, building district heating into the plans for quite a wide area and that's something which um, the Greens have been pushing really hard and um, ha has come out of community consultation, actually grassroots consultation has led to that. So there are positive initiatives, but in order to make that really transformational change at a local level, we need more Greens in these roles so that we can have that voice coming through um, and making sure that the, the, the carbon aspect of this is prioritised and not something which is a, a, you know, an also ran rather than the, the core focus of what we're doing. Thank you very much, Claire. I think um, that just makes it so clear why we need to, to get more Green councillors elected. <laughs> um, the fact that these discussions are taking place in our city councils is really welcome, but it could be transformative with, with more of you. Yeah. We'll do it. Um, and now, please pass it on to Ross Greer, um, who is going to give us his perspective. Thanks very much. Um, if that's, right, of course. Um, yeah, I... I'd like to talk about how we actually achieve the transformation we know is needed, because Claire and Robin have given us a really good primer on it, and this, uh, of any party conference, is a room full of uh, people who know what they're talking about when it comes to climate change on the whole. But where we've always struggled as a movement, I mean, the 
capital G green movement of political parties and small green the wider movement um, is in actually getting the groundswell to make a lot of this stuff happen. Um, I think we're at the point now where, on the basis of the scientific evidence, which is overwhelming, that we essentially have a decade left to save the world, that we need to cut out the bullshit and stop being civil about this. We are constantly told that we need to be civil and reasonable and compromise with the other side. The reasonable, logical, rational thing to do is to fight like hell for the survival of a livable planet. But we are constantly told to reduce our aims, be less ambitious, because we need to keep everyone else on board. The science says that's not good enough anymore. We are out of time to do that. And we need to start thinking really seriously about how we achieve a level of uh, a speed and a level of political change that very, very rarely happens in, in the time scale that we've got. And that's where I think that we as a party are in a really important position because we believe firmly in the transformational power of electoral politics. That's why we're all here. Uh, but we also believe in movement politics. We believe in what happens on the street and in communities just as much as we believe in what can happen through parliaments and through council chambers. And it's how we combine those two that we get something much more powerful and genuinely transformational in the time that we've got left. Because with the best will in the world, when the IPCC says 12 years, that's only a couple of elections. How much change can we make purely through those elections unless we're leveraging the movements day in, day out in communities on the street to make that change happen as well? And those two feed into each other. Strong movements result in electoral success as well. Because what we're blessed with in Scotland is a really strong NGO sector in this area, folk like WWF, Friends of the Earth, who do a really, really good job. But we have a comparatively very weak movement on the streets compared to where we might have historically been at points in relatively recent history in the last few decades, for example, the uh, campaigns against motorway uh, expansion that was involved a huge amount of direct action in the 90s. We were building towards it with the anti-fracking movement. Uh, the reason that we don't have that radical direct action anti-fracking movement is a good one. We won on fracking, um, and that's fantastic. But if you look down south, fracking movement is fighting hard against this because it is now starting to happen again. People are being jailed then released from jail, uh, thankfully. Uh, you look at across Europe, in Poland, it's massive mobilizations to save forests. In Germany, it's thousands of people blockading the railways to stop lignite coal uh, being transferred to power stations to be burned. These radical movements that are delivering that kind of direct action and the direct change that comes from it, that is something that I think we need to start growing here in Scotland because we're also in a slightly fortunate position in that much of the most obviously problematic stuff is not happening on our doorsteps because of the lack of like night coal fire power stations or fracking etc when that's happening on your doorstep you're much more likely to mobilize a large number of people but that's also resulted in scotland and i think a bit of a, a dishonest consensus as if um, climate change is kind of something that's caused elsewhere that actually we're really fortunate in scotland because when we passed world leading climate legislation it was done by consensus that every party agrees to this that's nonsense. We're the only party that come anywhere close to what the scientific consensus is on how we save the world. And the, that was put in really sharp perspective for me in recent weeks where we had a photo call of all five party leaders who were uh, committing uh, themselves and their parties to the cause of climate justice. And I think it's really useful that we talk in terms of climate justice now. That's great, five party leaders all standing smiling. Four of those five party leaders the next week we're getting out the bunting and the streamers because we found a new gas field off the west coast of Shetland. These two things are incompatible. But the, the way the debate happens in Scotland acts as if they are actually entirely compatible. We're the only ones with anything approaching coherent, consistent policy on this. And we need to break that debate open. It's gradually starting to happen. You we're not remotely surprised that that's the kind of position the Conservatives take. But when you've got pseudo-progressive parties like Labour and the SNP, who will stand with us on the one hand and talk a good game about climate justice, rhetorically, the Scottish Government are absolutely in the right place. But their action is beyond deeply inconsistent. And one of the, the best examples of that that we raised in Parliament has been in regards to international development. Fantastic that the Scottish Government has an international development budget. It's very engaged in it. It's a great example of how we've pushed the limits of devolution. There are some really brilliant projects tackling climate change, climate justice projects being funded through our international development program by a government that is also committed to maximum extraction of fossil fuels from the North Sea. Mm -hmm. A government that is 
committed to causing the climate crisis and committed to helping people mitigate the effects of the climate crisis. That's the dishonesty in this debate that we really need to break open. So for us, it's a challenge about how do we communicate this? Because if you won the debate on the basis of who had the strongest evidence, then we would have won a long time ago and this wouldn't have needed to be a debate. The scientific consensus is clear, it's only grown louder uh, and starker as time has gone on. Unfortunately, that's not what people respond to. So we need to think about how do we tell effective stories about this? How do we get people emotionally invested in the kind of transformation that we know is needed? And the story I usually tell is I went on a trip to Lampedusa in Italy last year. It was um, through the, the Church of Scotland that I was representing, not the party. Um, but we were there to visit the uh, refugee solidarity work that was going on. Brilliant, amazing work by charities at Mediterranean Hope. And I've met a huge number of uh, refugees over the last few years who have fled war and persecution. Lampedusa was the first time I had ever met a substantial number of climate refugees. I met a, a young man there called Emmanuel, younger than me, he was uh, 17 at that point, who was telling me all about Ghana, so incredibly enthusiastic about his country, telling me he wanted to take me back there one time and show me it, his family's farm, it was beautiful. Uh, but then he told me the reason that he had made that journey across uh, Africa from Ghana to Libya. He'd been kidnapped twice and held as a slave, uh, and then he had survived the journey over the Mediterranean, but some of his friends had not. The reason he'd made that journey is because his family farm isn't there anymore because of climate change. His family had nothing left. He was forced to make that journey. He wasn't sure where many other members of his family were. Those are the kind of stories we need to tell to get people emotionally invested in this, because we're talking about complete transformation. The two options on the table are profound crisis or the kind of transformation that creates a better world. Whether people like it or not, the status quo isn't an option. So we need to start thinking about how do we articulate this in powerful ways, not just in parliament and in council chambers, but on the streets and in our communities as well, and build communities and movements that can tackle this with a speed and an urgency that very few other issues have ever required or achieved. Thank you very much. I think we've heard three excellent, thought-provoking contributions, and now it's your opportunity to ask any questions, make the odd comment. Um, I, and if you just, um, we do need a roving mic. There's one roving mic. Uh, there's, and there's one roving mic. Um, and if you can just share your name and where you are from. Thank you. Uh, point of order that Ross Greer deliberately handed the microphone to the most unfit guy in the room. <laughs> what have I ever done to you? <laughs> All about active living. Mary Johnston from, <clears throat> from Glasgow and everywhere. Um, a, a question for Claire. I'm really interested in, in what you're talking about with regard to budgets. And um, I'm interested also in how we develop methodologies for budgeting in, in, you know, in, in a session this morning, I talked about measuring, how we measure things, and that's basically what a budget is, it's a measure. Um, so are you aware of any really, really good um, examples of um, interdisciplinary budgets? Okay, Claire? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I think that it comes down to measures quite often, doesn't it? That's what drives what people do, and so that's why I've got an interest in it. Um, we looked to Aberdeenshire, actually, because I think it might be Martin Ford, I think, who um, actually managed to have carbon budgeting implemented in Aberdeenshire Council. Um, so we've got that example from him, and we're now looking at whether we can implement that in Edinburgh as well. Um, and, you know, I think that that would just take us a step further forward. I, I would eventually like to see us um, knowing for every single thing that the council's doing, what impact it's having um, and whether it's a, a plus or a minus, what is the net effect um, and having, a, having an overall target that we have to stick within because, like you say, that, that's all budgeting really is, is saying this is the amount you've got to spend and, you know, when you're done, you're done. I think that if we can get to that stage with carbon budgeting, that would take us a much, so much further forward. Because at the minute, the, the financial budgeting is the bit that's really driving all the decision making um, in, you know, in terms of scarcity of resource. And it's not at all measuring the scarcity of resource in terms of the environment. Thank you. I think Robin would like to comment too. Yeah, just a little bit on um, one particularly important, I mean, all 
all governments and all spending is really important in terms of climate change, mm -hmm. but a part that is especially important is the infrastructure and the capital spending that, that governments do, because if, you, if we build the wrong stuff, then we're, we're stuck with infrastructure that is no use to us and we can't use in that zero carbon future that we need to have. Um, and likewise, there are really big infrastructure changes that need to happen so that we get to that zero carbon world that we're building towards. Um, so again, in the spirit of being uh, nice to my hosts, uh, I think something really important that the Green Party secured in the last budget negotiation uh, with the Scottish Government was a commitment from the Scottish Government to continue to increase the proportion of infrastructure spend that went towards um, low carbon uh, projects. Um, and one of the things that um, was announced uh, last week at the SNP conference was the creation of a National Infrastructure Commission and something that WWF feels is really important that uh, now there is a commitment to creating a National Infrastructure Commission that that commission has some has a has a like a really zero carbon thread right through it that a core purpose of that commission is to advise uh, national government but perhaps local government as well mm -hmm. on what are the infrastructure projects that need to happen in Scotland that take us towards that zero carbon future that we want. Okay, we'll take more questions. There are a few hands going up already. Linda Hendry, Stirling. To help the farmers diversify in Scotland and to do something about climate change, the Scottish Government urgently needs to reduce the red tape round about growing fibre hemp. It's a seed and fibre crop that you can build with, you can use for paper, but the Regulations are very onerous and expensive for farmers, so they put them off. It's worse than growing seed potatoes. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions in this. If we could. Okay, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to shout. Uh, my name is James Pukowski, uh, co convener at Edmund Young Greens. It's regarding Ross's point about um, kind of making, uh, if I'm allowed to paraphrase in a way, kind of making the point of zero carbon economy kind of more attractive to the average voter and are basically trying to get them on board with the same plans that we have. I think one of the major green points that we have is that we try to kind of promote local democracy and the idea of the local economy. Part of the low carbon economy, for example, is to focus on renewable, renewable energies uh, and that can be done at the local level on coastal and rural communities. And that is something that is really important if we want to highlight that we aren't just about pandering to large cities and large urban conurbations, but about the idea that a zero carbon economy ties into our idea of a, a local uh, democratized and uh, how, not federalized, because that's the wrong way of putting it, but a Scotland of, of local government. And um, that's the sort of thing that I would like to see in the future, because if we're gonna try to kind of tie this into everything else that we do, the idea of local democracy and trying to assure people that there will always be a, a local economy that is strong and stable. <laughs> Not to paraphrase that's reason, uh, but uh, 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 basically uh, there in place. I think that's a very attractive point, and I think we'll get a lot of people on board who are uh, particularly worried for the future as, as regards the, the so-called brain drain that we see on many of our lo local and rural towns in the country. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think those points are very well made. Um, I would like the panel to address Linda's question, which was specifically on making it easier for farmers to grow hemp. Does anyone have a comment? <laughs> I'm a city girl. In the, the city centre, Wait. Claire, come on. I was going to say, I'm a city girl, it's not my question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't comment, I suppose, on the, the specifics of any particular crop, but I think a, a really important concept that um, is, is gaining traction is this idea of a, a just transition. Mm -hmm. So um, finding ways to work with uh, people who are invested in some way, whether that's owning a business, running a business, or working uh, in a particular job or role, and taking them with us as we move to what the future economy looks like. Um, and I think that really strongly applies to um, the farming community. Um, I think the first thing to point out is that farmers, uh, you know, it, Ross talked about farmers in other countries being on the front line of climate change. That is also absolutely the case here in Scotland. It will be those who live from the land who are first and most impacted by climate change. Um, but those who, who live and work on the land in Scotland also have a really important role to play in tackling climate change, um, partly because uh, 
there are really significant climate emissions from agriculture, particularly in terms of fertilizers and so on, and that's something that we need to, to move away from, those um, industrial fertilizers. Uh, and then secondly, also coming back to that, how do we actually take carbon out of the atmosphere? Um, those who, who work the land and are custodians of the land have a really important role to play in terms of restoring soils and in terms of um, um, growing crops in a way and crops that, that, that do that. So again, it comes back to the, the trees point, agroforestry, really important part of that as well. Okay. Um, Eloise from the Highlands and Islands. Um, I had a question. So we know that in the, your, uh, the EU Commission, uh, one of the main problem to tackle climate change is the pressure of the lobbies from the industries. And we saw this recently with the glyphosate um, problematic. And I was wondering what is the pressure, the lobby pressure of the companies at the Scottish Parliament, um, and is it a problem? And also, as a, just a comment, uh, when I want to engage, to engage um, about climate change in conversation, it might be a bit extreme to say that I'm a climate refugee, but um, I don't like heat and I'm from the continent. <laughs> and to be fair, the last, I hate going back to France in the summer, because it's just like five, this month, this year it's been like five, good months of heat and at the moment still like 25 people are in t-shirt at night and it's just like a few kilometers away from here uh, and even here the the the, um, the what do you call uh, the summer uh, was like a good three months um three solid months of, of of summer and it was really uh already really worrying so um yeah just as an example to engage the to any everyday life Okay. A conversation. I think we'll give that question directly to Ross with regards to lobbying power in Parliament because there's a lot of hands going up. Um, so we'll take that question and then we'll move over to the other side of the hall. Yeah, I mean, the, the short answer to that is that this is a massive problem, that this is a powerful lobby within Scottish politics in general, not just within the Scottish Parliament. Obviously, these are parties who operate at Westminster as well as at Holyrood, with the, the exception of ourselves. Um, the biggest challenge that we've got with the level of lobbying, and you can check it for yourself if you want, because we now have a lobbying register in Scotland that is far from perfect, but it does exist, is that lobbying from the fossil fuel industries in particular is not really seen as a bad thing. In the way that, for example, in our campaign against the arms trade, we can get good press coverage out of how outrageous it is that Scottish government ministers are meeting with arms companies like Raytheon, uh, that they're requesting that there's no press around those meetings, because arms companies are broadly seen as being a bit distasteful. The public discourse in this country is not yet at the point where fossil fuel companies are seen as being as distasteful, despite the fact that they are causing monumental amounts of destruction and human suffering across the world as well. So the challenge for us is, within the parliament we can object to it, they get their receptions, they get meetings with ministers, they get meetings with the other opposition MSPs, we can't stop that. What we need to do is shift the public discourse around this so that fossil fuel companies and their lobbying influence is seen as just as distasteful and just as unacceptable as that of arms dealers. Because only at that point will you start to get the kind of public pressure through press coverage, through constituent lobbying that might actually put some of our colleagues and other parties off from meeting them. Because at the moment it's completely normal. They would not blink an eye. These people are in all the time. They get receptions hosted by MSPs from all four other parties. They get uh, access to government ministers without any issue at all. Because that is the normalized culture of not just our parliament, but, but parliaments across the world. We need to change the culture because we're not in a place where we can change the rules and actually ban them from the building, though that would be fantastic. Yet, yet. Um, <laughs> I, I'd like to warmly welcome Senator Grace O'Sullivan to the panel. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll if, if you can sort of share your thoughts with us while responding to maybe the next couple of questions, <laughs> not to put you on the spot. Um, the other panellists have had five minutes each, so feel free to answer maybe at a bit more length. But we've got quite a few hands going up here. I know um, Mr Whitelaw, uh, further up the back. Um, and, and, you know, Ross was speaking earlier about the fact that we need to stop being polite. So if I don't see you, just jump up and down in your chair and shout out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, now I've really started it, haven't I? I? I see you there too, Paul. Yes, we'll get to you. Thank you. OK, carry on. Um, hello. Alistair Whitelaw of Glasgow. Um, 
before I ask my question, I'd just like to say thank you to Ross for making the very, very important link between climate change and human migration. Mm -hmm. This is something we need to publicize much more, particularly in countering the political right, who, of course, mm -hmm. are the climate change deniers, often. Uh, anyway, I've got a, a, a rather legalistic question for Claire Miller, or indeed any of our other councillors or MSPs, and this uh, relates to getting tougher, uh, as I think we should. Um, is it or would it be legally competent for council planning committees to Im impose a requirement for including solar panels or heat pumps in any new buildings? And if it isn't, perhaps it's something we could add to our forthcoming policy on climate change at a future conference. Okay. I think but I'll is it currently legally competent to do that? Because if it is, we should be pressing for it. Okay. If um, Claire and then Robin could address that. Uh, yeah, the, the quick answer to that is I'm, I don't actually know. Um, I don't sit on the planning committee and I'm not totally competent on the, the details of what you can and can't do, so I, I won't give you an answer. Um, but I think what we do have is we have policies around you know, the requirements for new buildings and the requirements for any applications to change existing buildings. And I, I would imagine that within the, the scope of that, it is possible to put in some requirements, but I, but I can't definitively tell you whether it is or isn't possible, I'm afraid. Sorry, not enough of a planning expert. <laughs> okay, Robin, would you like to address that? If not, the um, person sitting next to Mr. Whitelaw on the steps may be able to. <laughs> Um, Andy Whiteman, MSP, <laughs> on the Local Government Committee, currently steering the planning bill through Parliament. <laughs> there are powers in the Climate Change Act to require to, that have to be triggered by ministers um, to enable planning authorities to require there to be micro-generation on new build. That provision, the government wanted to, to delete it, but we managed to keep it in, but it's never been triggered. Uh, by ministers. And the other thing is that this is actually a building regs thing, not a planning thing. Planning decides that a house goes there or a factory goes there. It doesn't decide the details. So, but we could toughen up building regs, and that's currently under review in the aftermath of the Grenfell Tower. So now's a good time. See, multitasking in the Green Party, roving mic and planning <laughs> questions. I was just going to I'm glad Andy mentioned building standards, because I think that, that's one of the clear ways to, to make more progress on this. Um, and actually, on the importance of making progress on this, half of all Scotland's energy use and ha roughly half of our climate emissions come from heating. And a vast proportion of that is still comes from fossil fuels. So kind of the next, the next really big agenda has to be decarbonising how we heat our homes. Um, two more ways that we can make progress on this. Um, the Scottish Government has, has been floating around for a very long time with this kind of concept of um, local heat and energy efficiency strategies that would have to be taken forward by uh, local governments. Um, it's something that's moved very slowly, but it's, it's something that, that needs to happen much more quickly. Um, relatedly, um, the SNP manifesto talked about a warm homes bill. Um, so far, all the Scottish Government has brought forward is a fuel poverty bill that has um, to only targets about eliminating fuel poverty and arguably not even about eliminating fuel poverty and are not doing so for a very long time away. But uh, something we'd much, uh, we much want, want to see in addition to that is that, that piece of legislation being much more uh, effective in improving the energy efficiency of our homes and making progress on this issue of, of defossilised mm -hmm. uh, heating. Okay. Do you like yeah. to comment? Just um, in relation to Ireland, um, you have the retrofitting of social um, housing. And what has been found to be quite inefficient is that the um, uh, construction industry go in and they uh, do a retrofit, but it's not a deep retrofit. So what we're calling for is that if you do go in and if you, um, and you carry out uh, the necessary measures to ensure that the house is, um, is no longer leaking uh, carbon into the atmosphere or, and, and you also have, um, you're supporting in terms of fuel poverty, but that you do it in one move. So instead of going in and causing some inconvenience to the dwellers in the house for the first stage, but that you do it all in one measure so not bits and pieces. And a lot of the, what we find, a lot of the projects, they're, they're still on a, a pilot basis. 
So there's not one big policy where we say all, you know, the whole of the housing stock will be retrofitted. But it's, look, we do a pilot here and we do a pilot there, so it's not, um, it's not being rolled out entirely. The other thing, there's incoherency in policy because um, new schools, for instance, um, were recently um, told that uh, they had to continue to buy into uh, fossil fuel systems. So we have a huge opportunity in terms of public buildings to um, use solar and, um, and micro-generation um, that, uh, that the government is inconsistent in how it's putting its messaging out there. So that's not helping either. So we find that like it's piecemeal strategy. There's no <laughs> joined up thinking. I'm on the committee for um, uh, tackling climate change to make Ireland a leader in tackling climate change. I mean, at the moment, we're right down at the bottom. Poland is down the worst of the lead tables in terms of uh, carbon emissions and, that, and Ireland comes in next. So we're really laggards. And even our own Prime Minister recently admitted that we are absolutely laggards in this. So what was, um, uh, we had what we call a citizens assembly, uh, whereby a, um, a, a selection of 99 members of society were brought into over a two weekend period into um, a meeting where they received evidence from people who are expert in the area of climate change. And based on their, uh, th those deliberations, so the two weekends, when the public receive the information, the decisions that they took, so the recommendations they made, are absolutely, uh, they're, they're ambitious, they're, they're really positive in terms of the environment, in terms of decarbonizing, in terms of divestment, the whole lot. And so what I see now is that when people are given the right information, they, that the public, and this is evident from the Citizens' Assembly, will make the right decisions. So the, the public are shooting ahead and the government actually is way behind. So we have a committee at the moment um, which sits uh, once a week and we're working towards a report to the government in January. But like I said in the plenary session, it's just not soon enough. You know, this is something where we have to take action now in every way possible. Here, here, thank you very much. Um, up the back there and then over here and then at the front and then yourself and then we'll probably have run out of time. So if I could ask for, okay. yeah, we, we have 10 minutes left and I want okay. to try and get everyone in. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm Robbie Strachan from Aberdeenshire. Um, uh, my issue is about carbon capture and how we know trees um, are like a solar energy. They uh, breathe in carbon dioxide, they give out oxygen. Um, if you take um, this auditorium times five and it was planted with trees in 35 years, you'll have trees higher than the, the height of this uh, roof here. Um, if you thin them, if you take every other tree out, in a year's time, you've got as much actual wood there as you had when you thinned those trees. You can then do that the next year as well. So, and, and you can c continue to do that subsequent year after year after year. What I'd like to know is why is there no thinning policy in, in Scotland for trees? We have a, a situation where all the trees are just cut down in Scotland just like that, leaving a moonscape. And, and, and if we're really interested in energy, we should be, have, have a thinning policy where um, we, can, we, will get far, we will get a constant supply of, of, of energy, of, of, of wood energy. But there's, there's no such thing as that in Scotland. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take questions in twos because of time. Um, Hello, you. it's Pamela Barnes from Linlithgow and West Lothian. Um, not far from Linlithgow is Grangemouth, a massive petrochemical industries and manufacturing. I wanted to ask the panel about how we promote zero carbon manufacturing and zero carbon industries. And I guess it kind of links with the woman at the front talking about hemp being an alternative for farmers um, and also Claire's point about urban areas being consumers of rural food, but also um, the manufacturing and um, industries. Um, so, yeah. 
Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask Robin to address the thinning point um, and perhaps Grace to address the, the latter question. I think it was just it was a point well made, like um, how we what tree, planting more trees and managing those forests properly is vital to taking more uh, um, carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, and also, it's, there's a really important biodiversity role. So, I mean, as you say, like managing them properly uh, once we planted them is also vital to this. I venture that it's because of our incredibly deferential attitude towards Scotland's landed class. <laughs> but I, it, it's a good point because we had a situation uh, last year in Ireland where um, we have this beautiful uh, hedgerow landscape as you have in um, Scotland and, and in England. And the hedgerows are like linear corridors, woodlands for habitats and for um, also for uh, growth in terms of um, it, it, tree, tree production and thinning. And, um, in, we had this legislation, the Heritage Bill, and the, the minister absolutely could not see the value in terms of thinning, so they kept using it as a, they kept saying it was road safety, and that the hedgerows are growing out onto the roadways, and that's creating a health and safety issue. Now that was already dealt with in our, already in um, our Road Traffic Act. But I mean, there was this, you know, I agree with what you're saying and I think you should come up with the motion to the Green, <laughs> Scottish Greens to present what you're saying because I think it's very, very valuable. We need to uh, have good management of uh, trees and hedgerows because the hedgerows are beautiful corridors you know so we have to but we need to you know you need to get that in in a in a motion or something so that it can be taken forward we really are running out of time i'm determined to get these two questions in from the front and we'll have your point addressed about communities who perhaps are hosting pitch chemical plants and so on at the moment what their future might be so can we have the mics down to the front here um here and then here andy i don't like talking fast Thank you. I sat surrounding Irish. Um, so, uh, so Danny Aldersloe, sorry, Dumfries and Galloway, and I'm a really uh, active participant in, in Permaculture Scotland. And we had our European gathering in Ireland this year. And so you could really sense the fear and panic in a lot of people, and that was before the IPCC thing last Monday. So to me, it's like, what can we achieve short term for a lot of people? Because I think that's really important for people to know that we just don't get apathetic about climate change, etc. So a lot of my background is food growing and we're achieving a lot with food forests in school. And it's really like just pushing the powers that be, you know, let's have a localised policy about food that feeds our schools at least. And how simple it is to grow local organic foods, you know, and just to create that whole abundance. And that then rolls all it rolls on into your impact on your local community. So in our little town and gatehouse of fleet, all our local trees persons, they drop off their chip bark, they drop off their grass cuttings at our school because we've designed it so they can drop their base off. You know, people donate, so we've managed to pull in the rest of the community. And when school started in September there, we had a local market and it was all from the food of the local school. So things that we can achieve, let's do them really soon. Because, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final question of this session. Hello, I'm Douglas Layton from East Dunbartonshire. From East Dunbartonshire. And um, I, I was aware when you were talking about P, uh, PV panels that one of the other uh, members of the audience. And um, about seven years ago, I, I did some detailed analysis of uh, PV panels uh, in the United States, where the conditions are much more favorable than here. And um, I, I did some uh, in about this country. And at the time, and I know the technology has moved on quite remarkably, at the time, there was a small pocket of um, England down in the very south. I can't quite remember exactly where. I think it was maybe Shropshire or something. And this was um, the only area in England that was considered to be viable with the technology as it was at that time, the PV technology. Now, I know it's definitely moved on. They, 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 uh, they've got much better 
uh, re results la lately, but I am absolutely certain that Scotland is still a very difficult place for PV. Um, we, we have very few hours of um, you know, sunshine and cl clear weather, as we all know, and this makes it very difficult to promote PV panels. I mean, the, the, the cost and the, uh, you know, the environmental cost of the, um, not just the financial cost, but the environmental cost of creating the PV panels to put them in a non-productive area is really rather questionable. And um, we need to think about that. And how, do it, I mean, it may well be worth it, uh, but you, it would have to be incentivized somehow. And the, the problem is that uh, the incentives boil down to money because most people will make the equation, they'll look at how much extra they have to spend on the PV panels, and they, they will look at the cost of the gas that they have to run in their, um, in their uh, uh, boiler. And, and they will find that the, the, the cost of running their boiler for an extra is, 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 is actually doesn't really match up to that, the cost of running the PV panels. Sorry, I know it's a long... No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very good point. So we have three questions there to be addressed. I'm going to ask um, Grace and Claire to address them, if that's okay. So um, our question from West Lothian on, you know, life beside a petrochemical plant and how it might be improved for, for those in the vicinity and beyond. Um, Danny's question was about what, what short-term gain can we deliver to communities now and, and the, the impact local organically grown food can make um, and a very important question there about PV panels, how much do they cost, what are the benefits, what are the drawbacks in specific environments, so Grace. Well first in terms of those who have to live beside a petrochemical company or factory, the, the, whatever can be done to move away from that type of energy creation so anything in terms of renewables that you can bring in there, at least it, it's a sign of hope if you get um, something. Uh, it's, recently I was told about a um, wind turbines off the coast of Oporto in Portugal, and they're floating to turbines. So like I look at the, the, the coast of um, Scotland, and I think maybe that's something um, you know, that could be considered uh, in this area. But um, no, it's, it's a dilemma because there will be a transition uh, period. So it's going to be difficult for those who have to live beside them. In terms of food and permaculture, I mean, like I, I um, think that's hugely important in terms of our health and the quality of the food. And I think there's, a, you know, our world is moving so fast. And most people living in urban centers, we're under so much pressure. And like what you, the, you know, this huge problem in terms of obesity and quality of food. And like, when are we going to make the connection between good quality home produce or, or properly organic? How are we going to make sure that the organic sector are getting the support they need? Because like, what's wrong with getting up in the morning and having a good quality homemade soup? You know, you make it, you'll make it in 10, 15 minutes, or your, or your good organic oats or whatever. So I think people really need to make that connection about the food we're eating, how it's, how it's getting to the market the, to reduce the carbon imprint. But it's the people who can produce good quality food for the market, for the country market. I mean, they are the people who have to be applauded. And permaculture itself, it's such a brilliant system because it's brilliant at, at you know, you're recycling paper, you're recycling the whole time in order to, to create your growth. So you have to be applauded for that. And then in terms of the PVs, thank God I'm down in the south of Ireland. So we have a bit more daylight than you have here in Scotland. But you're absolutely right. Like why aren't people thinking about the practicalities of the, or the options that we have in terms of renewable clean energy systems. So why would you put a system that is inefficient into a place where it's not going to work, it's not going to deliver? So that's why in Scotland, it's really important that you think of systems that actually will deliver efficiencies and, and will deliver the energy and give you 
some safe security, energy, uh, sec energy security. The one thing I do want to mention, though, is uh, um, it's an analogy I often use in terms of renewable clean energies. So wind, solar, whatever all, uh, methods are out there. Like I always think of in the 70s and in the 80s, like going with Greenpeace down to Antarctica. Like we had, there was no such thing as a little mobile phone. These didn't exist. But what it was was a room full of, of this kind of battery pack or something, big system. The more that we move into the clean, renewable, energy-creating sector, the more we can push and drive that, the, more, the better the efficiencies will be. So my dream is that one day, on the side of all our houses, that we'll all be micro-generating and that it'll be feeding right into the grid so that we're getting, like, it's almost energy neutral. So I think the ideas are out there and I think the people are thinking and I think we, as a species, we can innovate, we know how to do it. Um, but we need to move away from the industries that are destroying the planet and move into the new, new age of clean, healthy energy. Um, our final response from, from Claire. <laughs> We're really, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so over, over to Councillor Miller, if you would like to, to have the last response. Yeah, um, I thought it was a really good question about Grangemouth and the petrochemical industry. I think we saw, um, you know, when there's been power stations in Scotland closing down, we've seen, a, you know, a big impact on local communities that are all built around the economy of you know one industry in a certain location we had long Gannett closing down and you know and the unions trying to prop up jobs that actually are just not going to be sustainable in the long term and we've got you know we, we published a jobs transition policy um which you know i think still stands and is is the right approach it's we just have to actually explain to communities how to transition away from one economy to a different one and it's a challenging th like it's a really scary thing actually can you imagine if your entire community is going to be completely transitioned from one industry that it's been dependent on for years that is a massively emotionally challenging thing it's it's potentially you know just just so wide-ranging but in having a policy in the greens that would allow us to actually help people through that transition i think we should be trumpeting that more talking about that more and talking about how we could actually change grangemouth and change our industries in scotland you know we do have answers to these questions we just need to start communicating those answers better i think um in terms of the the short-term projects and, and food and so on um, that's the sort of stuff which councils do help with. I mean, that's genuinely where I think that we come into our own. We, you know, we do move at a glacial pace with a lot of things with policy, but actually we can do short-term projects and, and quick wins. And I think, you know, if you've got a green local authority, you know, and I don't just mean big G green, green councillors, but green thinking <coughs> councillors in your local authority, that's a massive source of um, empowerment for the local people, for people to actually, you know, create projects and do things. And um, in the same theme, kind of on the on the subject of PV and, and you know what kind of sources of heat and power we should be having, um, I mentioned right at the very beginning, Fountain Bridge. We've got this um, paper coming forward to Housing and Economy Committee in the next couple of weeks, which is looking at it. We're, we're now moving into the kind of procurement stage um, for for that project. It's a it's a great big site in the city centre, big brownfield site, um, and. My colleague Gavin Corbett has worked really hard with the local community, it's in his ward. And what they've done is the community have come up with big demands about needing to have district heating there. So rather than looking at PV or anything like that, they are um, looking now at procurement options for wastewater heat recovery and for ground source heat pumps. And that's the sort of thing which we need to see um, in the city, you know, in every brownfield development, because that's the sort of thing that will make a diff big difference in terms of air dependence, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning. Um, and really transformative projects like that, which are community-led, you know, the, the people who've come up with those ideas were the residents who live around the area and want to see a, a really big change there. 
Thank you very much. Now, um, Standing Orders Committee are looking at me <laughs> seriously. We, we haven't actually overran our hour. We're, we're within it. It was those who were later earlier. Um, clearly, this is a session that needs more time. Um, I think we should come back to this, but next year, let's have at least an hour and a half, if not two hours, because the interest in the room is overwhelming. I can only apologise to those whose questions have been unable to take. Um, I, I probably will recognise a couple of people, but please do come and find the panellists you'd like to put your question to. Um, in winding up, I'd like to thank again WWF Scotland for sponsoring this event. I'd like to thank Robin Carter. He needs to plug his campaign. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> this is our campaign on the climate change bill. Hopefully everything in there is really self-explanatory. We need a much more ambitious climate change bill. We need all the MSPs in the Scottish Parliament helping with us, helping us with that. If you want to fit in one of these and it says what it does and return them, you can either just put them in a letterbox, they're free post on the back, or there's uh, a bag down here and a box over there, and I can take them back yeah. uh, that way too. Do that, please. I'd also like to thank Councillor Claire, Claire Miller, Ross Greer, MSP, and Senator Grace O'Sullivan. Thank you all very much.